just here to say hello. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, uh, we're going to talk about Germany's TV and the Dead Ops Revolution. I'm going to introduce Gavin Mendel Gleason. He is our benevolent dictator for life, um, and he's the main designer behind Germany's TV. I don't really have too many announcements to make, um, uh, but um, uh, you know we are based here in Dublin. I think we're the first ever Irish developed commercially available database. We're open source, so um, we're always keen for people to kind of look at our technology, see what we're doing, tell us what they're interested in, tell us what they're not interested in, submit a pull request, <laughs> write some code, you know, anything that you can do to put the shoulder to the wheel, please feel free to do so because, um, or open an issue or, you know, get involved in our Slack group. Anything like that really, really helps in uh, supporting and promoting Irish developed technology um, that we think is, you know, is pretty cool, is uh, really up there at the cutting edge of what's going on in graph databases and um, uh, succinct data structures and all that sort of stuff that Gavin's going to talk about. Um, so after Gavin speaks, then uh, we're going to hand over to Chuck, and she's going to do a, a little bit of a, a workshop. So um, I will give it over to Gavin and take it from there. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm Gavin Mendelgleeson. I'm the CTO for uh, Data Chemist, which makes Terminus TV. Uh, and I just want to—I'm going to give you guys an overview of what, the direction that we're trying to take the database, and why we're doing it, and why it matters. So, we want to be part of the data ops revolution. What does that mean? Okay, DevOps plus CI/CD totally revolutionized. Just to say, sorry, yeah. before you get started, you know, we're a small enough group, so anybody has any yeah, questions at any point, reason. just you know. Get involved and totally. say anything at any point. Totally. So, uh, <laughs> DevOps plus CI CD has uh, totally revolutionized software delivery. So, before Git, you know, the, the world was a darker place and uh, it was much more difficult, and the, the sort of pipeline that people went through in order to do code delivery uh, was very cumbersome, messy, and often, you know, builds would be some kind of thing that would require a lot of effort, and you often have people that would disappear for a week or something like that and then nobody would know how to do the build process or whatever. A lot of this stuff doesn't exist anymore because of the changes to, um, to the way that we develop software. So CICD, what is it? It's continuous integration and continuous deployment. So you have, you have pipelines, you have repositories, and you, you basically make your whole process for delivery something that can happen very automatically. Maybe not completely automatically, but a lot of automation in the process of <coughs> going from development to uh, build and, and deploy. So testing is built into the pipeline usually. So we, have, we write code, we check it in, we run tests on it, uh, we merge that from test into dev or something like this, uh, and then some performance tests or, or, uh, or you perform an acceptance test on the information and then you merge to master and then you know that kicks off a whole chain of events that builds the thing makes it docker for you or you know puts it into some kind of kubernetes deploy all of this stuff happens quite automatically and, and the whole process of writing code has changed drastically because of it so but data ops is not like this. Databases are still completely in the stone age. And the way that uh, people actually use uh, information is even worse. Like, so it's oftentimes you don't even have a database. People are using data from CSVs that they're emailing to each other, putting in a blog store, or, you know, uh, and then you'll have, you know, the, the classic example of the CSV, this is the final, final, final dot CSV, or cleaned final, <laughs> Point three or something, you know, and uh, it just it goes on forever. So uh, you also have all of these uh, problems about uh, when you have code that goes with data that you need to know which one you were talking about. So I, I really I don't know if any of you guys anybody work with the machine learning at all. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what were the results with the hyperparameters we used last week in the GAN? So that you have some kind of like generative um, uh, adversarial network or something like that that you're using and you need to know what the hyperparameters resulted in and you, 
you lost the data because it overrode it or something like that. And there's no way that you can go back to check it without rerunning it. And so then it takes another five hours or something like that to run the thing. And it really slows everything down really badly. Okay. So yeah, and here's the examples. You have data, you do some kind of data cleaning step, and then you make a model, and then, the, then you process the data again because you realize you needed more data cleaning. And so then, actually, you know, you need a different model now, and then you process data final, and then, you know, which model went with which, and where is it, and you've overwritten these things. Uh, it's, it's not a, a great situation. Okay, so right now, knowledge collaboration. How is it done? How are we actually managing these things? Well, we're managing it badly oftentimes, but uh, you, we do have databases. It is possible to use a transactional database. And, and some of the more sophisticated uh, machine learning shops will try to store information in a database and try to track it that way. Um, they give a shared view of the world, so multiple people can collaborate on a shared view of the world. However, they don't store revision information automatically. So if you want to keep information about stuff in the past, you have to model that in your database alongside your data model. Uh, they can't, you can't easily just take a database that's already existing and try some experiments on the database itself by maybe adding new, I don't know, if you're in, in, uh, in machine learning land, you might be adding new tags to something with some kind of uh, new information or classification. And you can't, uh, you can't merge those changes back in afterwards because you couldn't even branch it in the first place. So this makes pipelining a real pain for, uh, for data ops. So like data ops doesn't exist partly because uh, there's a lack of tool chain. Just on the, on the revision uh, perspective, like if you, if you went to trouble calling a transaction database in your definition, top one point. Uh, are you implying that, there, that you should have made a better decision in the first place, based on your purpose? If you if you end up no, you know, finding out or knowing that you will need to revise this and have a systematic way of showing the, the life cycle, is that is that? Yeah, I mean that's often what happens. Is what hap you you build the database, you have the data model, and then you're like, oh man, actually I need to have revision information in here, and then you add another column that tracks revisions, and you do an update of that, but you have to build it in. And if it's spread across multiple tables, then you have to be careful about the versioning across multiple tables. And then you have to think about how you're going to build that back in to your database. And it's, it, it can be done, but it is very complicated and error prone. OK, so I mean, this is obviously probably going to help yeah. your, your plot. So OK, that, great. I think. So in other words, the point is that the lesson learned is that your, your choice of transaction database was clunky in the first place. But my question is, are there other ones besides what you probably would tell us about later on that <laughs> they'll always you know, foolishly think this is a good idea? Right? That's right. No, well, there, there are a number of uh, databases that are now coming out that try to do automatic versioning. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and for a number of reasons, we think that uh, ours is the best. And <laughs> obviously, uh, well, uh, we, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, it, as it turns out, graphs uh, make it much easier to do this than uh, a relational database management system. RDBMSs are built in such a way that it's a tricky problem. So there's like Pachyderm, I guess, is an example of, of one of these RDBMS style version control systems. But uh, it's it's more awkward. Yeah. It's more awkward, and we 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 get a lot of uh, magical wins by using a graph. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay. So the other thing, the other aspect of knowledge collaboration is that we want to communicate uh, so that we can understand what the data means while we're collaborating. And so if you have a rich schema language where you can describe a lot of the data points in depth and what they mean, how they interrelate to things then it's much easier for people to pick up the data set and figure out what to do with it. I, I don't know how many of you have uh, looked at a, uh, a database in, you know, at some SQL database and just seen a column that was like, you know, you know, CV underscore RT or something like that, and you're like, what the heck is that? You know, I don't know what that is or what value is stored in there. Uh, it's very common in, in database archaeology. So, uh, and it turns out that um, if you use graphs, if you do choose graphs, and you go for knowledge collaboration via knowledge graphs, then schema extension is much simpler than it is in, in the relational database management land. It's a little bit more tricky there. 
new classes and properties can be easily added and they don't really disrupt the, the, the way that things happened before. Uh, and our schemas are also uh, graphs, so you can also query and update them uh, inside of Terminus TV itself. So it's a very reflective uh, system. So why not Git? Well, Git is very good, very good for code. Maybe not the best. There may have been some decisions made that weren't so great, but uh, it, but it, it, it's quite good. It's much better than the old systems that uh, I grew up with. So. A line of code makes uh, a lot of sense for code. Maybe not the most sense. I mean, there's there's a, a possibility of sort of semantic code uh, diffs that would be kind of interesting, but it does work out pretty well for code. But for data, uh, the, that granularity just does not make a lot of sense. It doesn't really mean much. Git is not efficient for storage or transmission uh, of big data sets. So if you have a massive data set and you put it into Git, it's just treated like a blob and you can get information like whether it's different or not, but not information about how it's different and you, you uh, end up with a painful uh, process of diffs. Now there's ways of working around it. You can like dump those diffs out and then look through some other kind of lens with it, but it's, it's painful. It's not designed either to be searchable, so it's not, uh, it is not a database itself, it's just a repository. Okay. The other uh, thing that I wanted to bring up is that machine learning is quite popular these days, but it turns out most of machine learning process is about data cleaning and data management, and only like 15% or maybe 10% of it is actually modeling and trying to figure out how to classify. Most of the rest of it is, is, is uh, dealing with these other hard problems. So, and when you're doing machine learning, you're often, you have multiple people, maybe trying different models out, different kinds of uh, approaches with the same data set, and you want some way for them to collaborate. There's huge numbers of potential classifications and tags, and things may, you might want to do things speculatively. Uh, you often want to couple your results with the hyperparameters that produce them, uh, and that's, I mean, there, there's a, it, you can always find a bad shop that does things badly, right, but uh, my experience is that a lot of them have, uh, a lot of people who are doing this are just sending CSVs around. If you're lucky, uh, you'll get a database in your machine learning house. Uh, uh, but how do, how do you structure it? And so we're back to this problem of like, you're gonna have to structure all of these things about revision control and how you're gonna manage it across different people. And you have the problem of, okay, I wanna run the, this huge uh, training set and I don't want to uh, have to keep downloading the database completely every single time I do it, right? And so if you're trying to collaborate with other people on, on, on it, that's quite awkward. All right. Oh, and what the heck did we do last week? That's, yeah, that's the revision part. Mm -hmm. So, but data ops is not just for ML, it's for anyone who wants structured data that evolves over time. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. This, this is our, our uh, attempt. So uh, you can query the database, you can obtain the latest information if you just uh, fire a query at the database. You can, get an, uh, you can update the shared view of the world by collaborating and we, we have a distributed system so you can essentially pull changes from uh, a central database repository and you get the updated database or you can push your changes back to it. You can, uh, you can query back in time, so you can look at the database at any of the former commits and you get a snapshot of what the database looked like at that time, so you can actually time travel. You can even uh, travel in Windows. You can, um, you can branch an old commit uh, and try something different, so you could say, oh, well, maybe we went the wrong direction here. You can branch it and go off and do something else. And you can query the metadata about commits and branches to enable uh, much more complex sort of pipelining, CI/CD type things for data. So, we are a Git for data. We're, that's what we're trying to do, uh, and we want to make it possible to do CI/CD on data. So we allow you to clone, branch, merge, time travel, rollback, 
You do any of those sorts of things that you expect from your revision control system on a live transactional database system. So, uh, sorry, that's. Yeah, okay. Coming from this particular question, yeah. so how do you make sure this querying of metadata about the commits and branches? Is it like, if there are like parallel deployments going across in a huge organization from developers and every stuff, so how do you particularly track that particular stuff? So is it from version control systems that you try to can say on capture the metadata or how exactly this stuff works? I'll show you an overview in a minute. Okay. Yeah, so I think it'll be helpful to have a picture because it's a little bit complicated. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I think those were all covered. Though, so. so this is uh, essentially the, the basic graph structure that we have at the lowest level. Um, it's composed of these, uh, these layers, what we call layers, and in each layer there's uh, edges on the graph uh, and if they have negative edges and positive edges. So, so it's possible to store both negative information, things that have been deleted, and positive information, things that have been added. But it's done at the level of, a, of an edge. So it's the source node, the edge, and then the target node. And this makes it quite, uh, it, it, it's a very flexible model because most, almost any data structure could be you know, coded, well, any data structure can really be coded as a graph. It's quite easy to, to put like you know tree structures or table structures, etc., into a graph. So when a query comes in, it comes in uh, here. It searches the positive layer. It goes down below. It searches the positive layer until you get to the very end of the database, and then you you uh, boil back up and subtract out anything that has been subtracted from from the query. When you do a, a, a committing transaction where you do a write to the database, what we do is we have the query, it fires off, it constructs a layer builder. This is then committed to an actual layer, and then some kind of uh, validation process can happen on this layer, and if the validation succeeds, then it commits it and it sets head, and then it points back, it's the new uh, database for, for your system. Is that internal to the database, the validation, or is it some rules that you set? The validation that we currently have is based on the OWL schema that you have produced, uh -huh. and so we constrain the data to, to be confined to uh, the, OWL, the OWL schema. But it's also possible you could put in arbitrary queries at that stage as well. Okay. So if you had some other constraints that you wanted to test or check. Um, and yeah, I think. We don't have a hook for it yet, but I think it would be interesting and useful in CI/CD processes to be able to put something arbitrary there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is sort of the the system architecture in in real fact. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated than I said, and uh, <laughs> and even worse, it's it's layers all the way down. So. Uh, we have a core database, and it just stores the information about all the databases that you have in the system, and it's actually composed of graphs that are themselves layers. Okay, so we store the, the information in there. Then from a, a particular, you open a particular database, you get a repository of metadata uh, database, which is also a, a set of graphs, and it has information about which remotes you have, and it always has your local, your local version. Then this, uh, so local points to another uh, set, graph set that then uh, contains information about the commit history. So it gives you all the information about all the commit history that happened on this particular database in a queryable th format. So you can query it, find out what was going on, who changed, what changed, etc. And then uh, these layers actually point out to the individual layers of the database that allow you to reference and search. So if you had some ref to this commit here, then it, you'd be able to obtain the layer uh, at which that ref uh, starts. And then it, you can query the database from there. So the way that the, uh, to answer your question, the way that this works is uh, when you do a query transaction where you do an update, you create a, a new layer and then you update this graph with a new layer that says that your new master and commit are pointing here, and then you go up to the repository, and then you, you do a new layer there as well for that. 
So it's really about uh, data operations when you have data sets and knowledge that you need to share and you want to kind of keep it compressed, but they may not be, uh, like, and it can be transactional. It is a transactional database. It works quite well for transactions, but just probably not millions or billions of transactions. You wouldn't want to do that. So there is a kind of time slicing piece, though, for that kind of... That's right. So in terms of time slices, if you want to extract uh, part of the database, so if you were, you could load it uh, daily or something like that from some fast time series database, uh, do the daily ingest or something like that, and then you'd be able to ca capture a slice of the database at any point in time or between any two points in time, which is often, I guess, uh, useful in banks and hedge funds because uh, they want to know, you know, what happened in these six months or something like that. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have five minutes, you can get a beer and you can come back and we're going to do the next bit. <laughs> yeah, we're going to um, do some hands-on exercise, so you're going to try out our... So, uh, welcome back. Uh, for this session, uh, it will be less than an hour, but we will make you to create your first uh, Terminus DB graph visualization within an hour. So, um, so yeah, the most important thing is, of course, uh, get Wi-Fi. <laughs> and uh, also, like, grab the slide deck because um, you will need to, if you haven't done it, if you haven't installed uh, Terminus DB, if you haven't, you know, download uh, anything, then, well, you can actually do it at home if you kind of like, oh, I have to wait for it to download and I can't catch up. But yeah, grab the slide deck, it's going to be helpful because I also like have a link to all the materials. So it, it's going to be very important. So um, yeah, take a picture of the slides. Uh, I think that, that's what I recommend you to do. I'll give you three seconds. Three, two, one. Oh, OK, next. <laughs> So about me, uh, uh, I, I think I'm kind of a new face here. Um, I actually, I'm based in London, uh, so I have done a lot of things for the Python community. I have um, contributed to a lot of libraries. Um, so, and the most important thing, I am the developer of a card of TerminusDB. So welcome. <laughs> um, so uh, as I said, you have to download TerminusDB because uh, we've got to run this workshop locally. So this is a checklist, it's, it's very helpful because it can help you to go through what you need to download to have it running on your computer. But if you are one of the unfortunate people that kind of like no to everything, that's like the red half, <laughs> then which means that it's going to be quite difficult for you to uh, have the Terminus DB run on your computer with the Docker image. Um, it could be done, uh, but uh, for the tutorial, maybe you want to do it on uh, kind of coder just to you know quickly experiment it. If you really want, you can of course you know for example if you have a Windows Seven like I did uh, a few years ago uh, with another company, then I download a, a virtual box so I can build a virtual machine with uh, Linux Ubuntu in it. Then I can use Docker. It's quite pain, but it's doable. So yeah, um, so uh, all the steps are laid out here. Uh, it's actually quite easy. So first of all, after you have uh, grabbed the, I would assume that you have Docker, right? And you have grabbed the quick start here. Like for example, you are like, no, but you have Docker, yes. Then you go to the quick start and then open the repo. And uh, you just need to run um, uh, terminus container run. And then with that, uh, it would, set up everything and then have your Terminus DB running. So if you click on, um, if you type localhost 6363 console, you will actually go to this. So this is my 6363 console. I have something, this is an experiment, so ignore it. <laughs> but uh, we have, uh, so you would basically see just this. So this is the meta database that uh, Gavin talked about. So this is a database of all your database. <laughs> So it's kind of like metadata, don't mess with it. Uh, you don't want to mess with it because um, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> Gavin, can you tell what will happen? I terrible don't know. things. Yeah, terrible things, so don't <laughs> try it. Um, so so the first of all, if you you know you have nothing, just a metadatabase, so what you want to do is to create a new database. So you go to this slide, and then um, it's actually very easy. It's like filling in a form. So you give your database an ID. This 
ID um, can't use space or special character, so just be very, you know, nice to it. So maybe mm, my DB, you know, very simple, nice, doesn't matter. Or you can use some random numbers, up to you. Um, so, and then for the title, um, this is um, what is human readable. So you can basically make something, you know, more like a, like a title of, of your database, you know, you can be like, my first database, or terminus db database, terminus db, graph, right. Okay, so this is like, uh, I don't think you can put emoji in it, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, well, you can type anything. Uh, on top of it, you can put description. That's the advantage of uh, of us uh, compared to the table because table, you know, um, it's kind of later you will see that all our objects have similar structure. You can add a label, which is a name. You can add a description. So description, you can put more information about what this is. So for a database, you may want to put maybe the link of your data source, or maybe you can, you know. Um, Describe a little bit more about what this database is for. So maybe this is for like a um, uh, tutorial <laughs> of making my first database. So something like that. Uh, and so for each object, you can make a description. So instead of, for example, you have maybe go through the pain of or oh, having another documentation to describe it, you can just have it there, which is very handy. So click create uh, on the right bottom right, and then you see that successfully created database. It's a good thing. You have all this information you need here, so you can see with you know just one page. You can see the name and the description. Everything's here. Neat. Um, so it's also uh, well. I don't think you want to delete your database. You haven't done anything yet. So you may want to do one of these. So um, create documents or run queries. So in this tutorial, let's go back here. So you have already done this. Congratulations. Um, so what you want to do now is to create a schema using the query. So like Gavin said, we can use a JavaScript client to do that. So in this example, I will use the JavaScript client on the console. Um, uh, it's your first graph, so uh, it will be quite challenging to write the, the, your query from scratch because you have never done it before. So all the script is actually uh, on the GitHub repo. So if you click here, you will go to this. So this one has everything that we need today. You can also find Gavin's uh, presentation here as a PDF. So this is a really good link to have. Um, it's, yeah, it's very good. Um, so you can see all these JS are the scripts that we're going to use. Um, as I said, first step, create schema. So you click on create schema. So somebody's using uh, Slack. <laughs> um, right. So yeah, you see that, um, well, this is the, this is the um, script for create schema. So um, it's quite small here. So maybe let me try to copy and paste here. So I can see if I can make it bigger or it's actually quite big here. So, right. Uh, is it good or do you want it bigger? Bigger? A little bit bigger? Yeah? So, you can see that um, in this query, it's nested. Um, but the outer thing is a when course, so we, we call it a wacko when. So, what wacko when do uh, is always, um, it will have a condition and then it will have some um, other queries. So the, if the condition returns something which is not empty, not false, uh, so in this case true, so true is true, right? So yeah, it, I think in JavaScript, you know, you, if it's nothing undefined, it's like consider false, if it's false, then it's false, if it's true or have something that's true. So if you just put true there, then it will execute the rest of the thing. So what's the rest of the thing? Uh, <laughs> is an N. So what's a WACO N means that inside of N here, you see there's a lot of things. So all these um, different queries. So we use Waco N to combine all of these um, queries together. So they will all be executed simultaneously. So it's not, you know, ordered. You can actually put a bunch of things there, it will just create, like, run, like, execute together. So um, here you can see that the comma separate them. It's like JavaScript. You are familiar with JavaScript. This is familiar to you. 
So you separate all of them with commas. So this is the first uh, query with inside the n, second query inside the n, and there's a super big uh, third query inside the n. So let's look at the first two. It's easier. Um, it's a doc type. So it's kind of like creating a class inside a schema. So it's um, a class, you know, if, I assume all of you have uh, programmers, so you know a class, what a class is. Um, so we have the station, we have the bicycle, so we have two kind of class, two kind of things in there. Um, we put a label in it, it's like, as I said, everything in a database is, you can put labels, which is a name on it, and a description. So you can see we have a name, we have a description. Um, it's optional though, like for example this one, we don't have put a description, it's obvious enough, so we don't have to. Um, so the third class that we create is called journey. Journey is quite complicated uh, because journey has property. So um, you see that we create journey and then like label, like usual, but we have a bunch of property here. So all this journey, um, what make them interesting? Because we want to know where did journey start, where did journeys end, when it happened, what bicycle was taking that journey, and how long it is. So um, we want to um, have a bunch of property to be related to this journey. So you can see that all of them are created. Some of them are called object type property. So for example, the stations, of course, is actually something that belongs to the object, that, like the class that we created before, the station. So you can see that we have a name, but it's a type of a station. So start and end station, they are stations. Um, they also can have their own labels. So for properties, they also have their own labels. Or description as well, if you really want to, but it's too complex for our first example. So skip that. Um, but in, so other than the object type property, we can also have the data type property. So you can see that here, the duration is not something that we created, it's an integer. So integer is a data type, so it's not an object that we created. Well, everything is an object, but it's not something that we created. So it's data type, and uh, it's, well, it just means that it's a number. And it also got its own label. We also have something more complex, like daytime. It's also supported in our graphs. So bicycle as well, because, you know, we have we have to say what bicycle we care about it. So that's why we create a, a property. Excuse me, are you yes. defining the schema here? This is the schema here. So this is how everything should be structured. Later, you will see when we put the object in it, it can kind of follow all these structures. So yeah, so click, uh, click submit. You will see. Okay, yeah. So you will see this blue thing here saying that your query has returned something, which is good, um, it, which means that you successfully done something, right? So, but oh, we, there's nothing to show because we created a schema, so let's check the schema. So you see that we have created three class. Um, they have their own name, like the label that we put in, description, and uh, their parents, so, so the parents class, you can actually create a class that's a subclass of something, but we didn't do it in this example. But by default, everything you created is a, is a document that uh, you created with the doc type because it's created with the doc type, it's a document. So, um, also, you can check the properties. So, this, these are classes and properties. These are all the properties of the journey that we created. <coughs> you can see the domains, it's journey. And all of these properties, they, they have their different types. So, these are the uh, data type properties, these are the object type properties. Um, like before, you have names, you also have an ID for all these properties. So you can see um, that, yeah, they have all these like different um, prefixes that kind of tell you what they are. So these are like all objects that you created. Uh, not, not objects, but like class, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that you created, that you declare. These are the data types. So, yeah. Um, you can also do it in OWL. If you're super familiar with, with OWL, you're, if you're like Gavin and you know what you're doing, you can mess with this, but I, I, I don't do it. I, I, I won't recommend you do it like, if you're like me, you know, just start using it. So, no. <laughs> so okay. Uh, so what do we do next? We have to put the data in, right? So we only have a schema, so it's kind of like a skeleton. We don't have anything inside. So what you, we got to do now is we got to um, inspect the data. 
So it's very interesting. I gotta show you how because we have a script like before because we don't have to write everything ourselves. So um, if you go back to here, the, the, the folder we have for the meetup today, you see that we have lowdata.js. Ooh, awesome. So, whoa, it's quite big. Uh, I would actually show you step by step. So this is quite big and like scary. So I would just basically show you the first thing, which is this query. So I'll just copy this one for now. Go back to query, because everything query that you do is here. Um, oh, by the way, you can actually, um, I can show you like, you can change it to JSON RD because this is the original way that like the API, uh, you know, um, talk to the, the, the database, but um, this for your convenience, we have the Wacko.js, so this is much easier to write than this. But you can also write this if you really want to. Uh, Garmin sometimes do it, but I, I, I don't recommend you do this as well. <laughs> don't do what Garmin do. <laughs> so yeah, um, go back to the, this query. So what this query does is actually lets you to inspect the data. So um, yeah, you see that we have a one called get. So get is actually um, reading the data uh, from something. So what is something? So here you see that we have remote, um, which means that we are reading something from the internet. So you see that we put in a, a URL here. If you want to read something locally, uh, there's also another uh, method to do it. It's called uh, <coughs> file. So um, we have another tutorial uh, to show you how to do it. I will show you the link later, but uh, we are using remote now. So you can see this is CSV. We can also read other type of data like Turtoy uh, RDF, but again, we have another tutorial online which you can read it. Um, but now we are loading CSV. So um, we have, uh, but before this remote, you can see we have all these Waco S. So what this is doing is, um, you can see these actually are the column names. The first argument, they are the column names of this CSV. If you open this CSV, actually, you may be able to see. Oh, I can't open it because I don't have Excel on my um, laptop. So, uh, yeah, so you can try open it, download and open it yourself. You will see these are the, the column names. <laughs> and then this one's a special. So this one with a V colon means that is um, a variable that we created in the query. Um, you may refer to the same variable later um, in your query, but uh, for this one, we just is you know it's only mentioned once. So all these are the names that we've given to all these columns. So if we click submit, so you see that we have forty nine results, and they're all here. So all this it's very smart. Console is very smart that it grab all these. Uh, variables that you declare and it kind of created a table for you that show all these, you know, it's kind of like all these columns that is read from the CSV. This is just like your CSV, right? So what's the point? Like if we, I want a CSV, I already have a CSV, why I don't want to do this? Because this is just the first step. We want to load it in our graph. So let's copy the whole thing this time. So you know what the first thing does. If I put it here, okay. So the first thing we read in the CSV, so we call it a CSV, conveniently. <laughs> so this is just like creating another CSV in our console, okay? Um, and then, before we put it in the graph, because remember we have that structure that we created, right? We have the schema. So we have to do some modification to that table that we had before we can put it in there. So we have the data windows. So you see the Wangos is an array uh, in JavaScript, or list in Python, that uh, it has all these queries. So each query is, uh, is one Wangling that we do. So uh, in this example, you can see there are three types. So there are the type class, which, uh, for example, the duration when we have it in the table is, well, it's just a string, right? So, but we want it as an integer, because remember in the schema, the duration is an integer. So we want to class it as an integer. And because we have class it, we give another variable names to it. So actually, duration and duration class are two different things at first. Because um, this is more simple, and you, you will see the effect of select afterwards. So let's make a submit. So what this is doing here is um, grabbing all these things. So how do we do it? Um, 
So uh, everything in the graph is a triple. Um, so what it means is like, for example, the first triple means that give me all the journey object that is a type of journey. So, because this is a variable, right? So I, I don't really care, but this thing should be a type of journey. So please give me all of these things. So I just name it journey. Um, the second one means that all these things that I get for the first thing, uh, they should have a property called star station and give me off the thing that is the star station of this thing. So, but all these things are variable, so let's link the journey and start. Um, so yeah, they are all, all the same, right? So it's like something that is the property of the journey, give me all of them. Um, some of them are optional, so why? What is this all doing? Because um, if, if your data, this is quite clean actually, this example, but if in real life your data is quite dirty, some of them is missing something, for example, like missing a label, then if you run it without the op, what happens is like, oh, because we don't have the label, it's an error. It's like, we, we don't have that thing, sorry, we don't have it. But if you put an op, it means that, well, this thing, I'm not sure it exists, but yeah, if it doesn't exist, forget about it, don't worry about it if it doesn't exist. Uh, give me that if you find it, you know. So, yeah, so this is useful when you are not sure that that property uh, exists for all objects. It may be missing. So you can see that all of these, remember like we done before with the CSV, or this V, uh, from the query, it will grab it for you and, and I'll put it nicely as a table here. But when you look at it, it's a bit like, hmm, well, is this journey, look at this, it's like, oh my God, all this mess, like, I don't really care. All I care is like where it starts and where it ends. So can you not show me that? It's not very nice for presentation. Yeah, we can actually. That's why we have the select. So we have like one, two, three, four, four things in the select. We have the start, we have start label, end and end label. So let's click it again and see what's the difference. Oh, whoa, oh, oh. now, oh, I don't want to go back, okay. So we only have like four um, columns now. So select means that it's like select in your SQL. It's just, I, I, only give me those, like I don't care about the others. So yeah, it's, it's very neat. You have full control of what you want, what you output you get. So now, like from now, you know like how to input the data, you know how to make a query, but well, it's just table. Why why I do it in a graph? Why? Well, because we can do something more. <laughs> because well, if you don't want a table, because actually it makes more sense if it's uh, presented in a graph. So let's change it. So go to the last script that we have. Is the view. So this is a, uh, a Wahoo view object. Uh, they are a kind of different type of query that you have. So it's kind of, you can see that this is quite different from what you have before. And uh, also where you put it is different as well. So before all this query, you put it just here, right? So this time we want to put it as, we want to keep this query because we need it, right? We just want to change the look of this table. So click on this test tube thing. So it will open a new window for you. This one actually go with your query. So they work hand in hand. So this one, actually you can customize the view of your result. So now you can see it's a table. We want to change it, so um, let's replace it with the script. So you can see the fir first thing that changed is the graph. So it will be in a graph. And then the following is basically changing the, the um, settings of the view, which is the, the graph. So you can see that uh, a graph, we have different nodes. And um, for some of them, for example, um, because what we have, uh, actually, let's just um, make a graph first. Okay, so let's update the view. So this is just, you know, I, just give me a graph, I don't care. But this is very ugly uh, because it's so um, narrow as well. Let's make, it, let's make it bigger. Right, okay, update. Right, so now we have a graph. Ooh, we can zoom in and out, very nice. Okay, so. We have lots of dots. So what are they? What are they? Like, I don't know what they are. So uh, I can tell you what they actually are. They are all those um, things in the table. Uh, remember, in the table, we have like uh, all these columns and different cells. 
all of them will be a, a dot here and they're related to each other by um, if you know or if someone is somebody's label or if this journey starts from here to there because they're the same journey they're related but it's unclear which one is the label which one is the start and the end so that's why we have to customize it with what we have before so like this one right so you see that we want to hide a start and end label because we don't want the label to be a separate thing so we hide them um, for the end, uh, we will have a color, uh, we make it red. Uh, we also change the icon, we can change the icon to a bike. Um, again, you can maybe try to put in an emoji if you want. Um, the text, uh, you can, so this text means that when you have your mouse on it, it will show you, um, yeah, it will show you the, um, the, 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 the output of this as the text. So you can see the label can now become a text. And you can change the size of it, make it bigger so it's easier to see. You can change the charge, which means that the, the, the distance between the two, so how much attraction the two has. So it's like kind of like, you know, electrons, right? So they have charge. So the start are the same thing, you know, they also, you can change the setting of how far they are by collision radius. So yeah, that's updated. So you see, now it's very nice because each dot, you can see, there's got a little bike in it. It's red. It's, it's my favorite color. Um, also, um, you don't have all these different things hanging around because we have hide all the labels. Instead, the label should be showing. Yeah, should be showing when you have your mouse on it. And basically, each one of it is a journey. So you can see that there's actually some journeys that they are. You know, this bike maybe it goes from here to there, and then somebody hired to go from here to here, and then somebody hired from. So it's like the whole couple of journey is linked together because a bike got hired multiple times. So. Yeah, so basically that's your first graph. So if you follow through, congratulations, you have done it. And if you haven't done it, you can do it at home because uh, you must have already grabbed the slice. <laughs> um, so the last thing that I want to show you um, is, um, actually, uh, if you want to revisit this tutorial, we have a very nice blog there. Also in the same publication, we have the, the, the um, the tutorials that I described, for example, how to load the local file, how to load a Turtle RDF file. Uh, so you can find it in our publication, so it's here. And all this like, very useful information that is written by some of them, written by Garvin, some of them written by Kelvin. Um, so yeah, you can see like all these things. And some of our meetups, you know, we have pictures of it. <laughs> you know. um, if you're really, really not sure, you can join our Slack channel. Um, every information should be here in the uh, community. Uh, website here. So this is just the website that I made. We will change it soon, but um, for now it's this one. Um, you can see all our um, upcoming events. We will have a competition that is ending soon. Um, all the information is here. You may be able to win 100 quid if you want. Um, also, there's a webinar next week. So if you want to know more about Graph, um, welcome to join a webinar, especially when you're working from home and you feel a bit, you know, nobody's care about what you're doing. <laughs> Why not come to join our webinar, right? So yeah. Um, also, ask question on Slack. Just click on this one, you know, or this discourse, you know, or look at our GitHub. All these things you, we are all here. Oh, videos. We actually have videos. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, keep in touch, and we will have more content coming up. So thank you very much. So yeah, I'll go back to the slides and uh, like if you haven't taken a picture at the beginning like I advise but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Grab this slice to be useful. Yep. So yeah, what time is it now actually? Oh we oh actually we have time left. So you can um, have more beer, hang around, um, talk to Gavin, because he's the man who can answer any question. Um, so yeah. Thank you everybody. I was reminded though during Chuck's thing about the old joke uh, when she kept talking about properties, you know, why um, communists drink green tea because property is robbery. <laughs>